Welcome to the Assembly of Silence Radio Hour. Okay, here we go. I'm going to say, okay, here we go, as my signature for the beginning of the show. What do you think? So here we go, a a continuation from the previous episode, my conversation with John on a wide range of subjects, kind of circling around the ages, transitioning from the Piscean to the Aquarian age. What does that mean? Does it mean anything? That's kind of the overall topic, but there's plenty of other stuff in there too. It's the beginning of the show. I'm doing an intro, so I'm going to mention that this is a program that takes time and energy if you want to support it. Please go to patreon.com slash taijireality, T-A-I-J-I-R-E-A-L-I-T-Y. Or there are links to cryptocurrencies in the description and also a PayPal email address. If you don't want to materially support the program, please consider recommending it to friends, family, or maybe enemies. If you find something of value or if you you think there's something that would confuse someone who you'd like to confuse, by all means, please spread it around. So here we go. Enough delaying. That was the intro. Here is the program. Enjoy. Enjoy. What I was trying to get to was how wisdom will be understood in the great leveling and who will still be special because the Piscean age is all about finding a speciality and finding some kind of dominance in your field. And the Aquarian age that uh, seems to be more about a sharing process in which dominance is replaced by something else that's a fascinating and insight been, okay so rather than put anybody on the spot here i just wanted to feel out my whole position about how art and aesthetics fits into that because out of all the things to be leveled given uh, the more urgent problems of disparity that you're talking about, you know, when it comes to water and, and things like that, you know, I mean, that's a whole different aspect of what we're facing right now, which we really weren't facing in over the last 2000 years. You agree with that, right? Well, yeah, when we're talking about water, we're talking about not just, you know, access to clean water, which is kind of the materialist thing, but we're also talking about the abstraction of currency, which is a flow of uh, right? I mean, there's that. And then I think exactly. on a more fundamental level, we're talking about what's available to one in the present. And, and the trigram water is essentially the present moment, you know, that, at mm. least that's the way that I nice. interpret it. And so water as this fundamental, you know, from Chinese medicine point of view, it is the the zhir, the will that's re- directly related to the kidney that is sort of the basis for everything, because everything comes from water, right? All living things are essentially um, 90 some odd percent water. So we are all fundamentally an attribute of this fluid dynamic that is modulated by the cosmos, that, that, you know, the, the energy of the universe is what's creating the dance of life within the fluid medium. So, and access to the water is fundamentally access to life. So, yes, exactly. All right. So, given that that is a fundamental issue that we're facing now collectively as a humanity, as an overpopulated humanity, we still have elites. We've always had elites because... And this was something I wanted to say before. I mean, the interesting thing about where we're at right now in terms of our ingenuity and how this has always been a problem of Western expansion because it's always been cold in the West has to do with the fact that we've been burning oil and wood for fuel since, you know, way before the Piscean Age, you know. I mean, the discovery of fire was one of the very first things that humanity came up with. So the need to stay warm and the fact that over the last couple hundred years, we just over-engineered everything. 
you know, yes. oil in the lamp has become something else. And so has, you know, staking out one's turf simply because the world is such a smaller place now. And, and that's because just a fundamental thing. And it gets, it gets, the more we burn it up, the smaller it gets. And we have to also, I think, I- integrate the, the, the burning with the water. So, you know, the, the, the fundamental Taoist alchemy right. is between fire and water. So you're, you're bringing up, I think, you know, the perfect um, two issues that are the essential duality within which we're constantly negotiating. Absolutely. Right. You, could, you could look at the technological, you know, you, you mentioned human ing- ingenuity, and that t- technological development is essentially a form of burning. And the byproduct of it is this kind of uh, hardened technology that uh, that doesn't have water in it. <laughs> you know, it's it it's not well. It has it has electricity, so you could use electricity as another model for flow. And and electricity is okay. a, a kind of a, a basic, probably the most basic, quote unquote, water. Um, That's right. Which, uh, you know, you know, we are talking about our own self-awareness and our own uh, understanding of our electromagnetic tendencies on the level that the computer shoots back to us, whether we like it or not. That's one of the upsides of it. Yeah, I think it it it, and, it poses some real fundamental questions that are that I don't know that they're answerable, but the extent to which this artificial reality that so much energy is going into right now. I mean, that's actually a topic yeah. for a whole other discussion. But um, yeah, but it's clear that this is a trajectory that we're on in some fundamental way. And whether it's good or bad, it's something that we have to kind of come to terms with. And so there is this, you know, picture of let's say the Matrix, where people are folded into a virtual reality as a consequence of. Well, you know, within the terms of the Matrix story, it has to do with our battle with the machines that we've developed and also its effect on the environment. But you could also say that it's happening as a result of our own desires that that because desire and burning are synonymous. So the Mm -hmm. conspicuous consumption you know, humanity of great passions that came about as a, as a product of the Piscean age was a burning and, and has transformed the surface of the earth into something else, you know, and, and like in the five element system, the, the byproduct of the churning of the earth is the metal, which is a concretization within which new types of, uh, flows occur because it's the structure that determines the way that the waters can flow. And so inside of the yeah. machine now we have this incredible flow, one of which is this podcast. So this podcast is available within the context of this construction, this uh, cybernetic construction. So people can listen yeah. to it and, and enjoy the the properties of it. And so then, like, the question of can we reframe this story, because obviously this is happening, right? We're, to some extent, living within uh, virtual realities, and some people are really getting into it now, you know? Like, uh, it, take it, putting on the headset and spending a lot of time as an avatar and this or that simulation. Yeah. But even those of us who aren't doing that, you know, we're participating in a wide variety of ways, whether it's just, like, you know, t- tweeting or Facebooking or making a podcast. So it's obviously a, yeah. a deeply integrated part of reality, even though it is artificial, <laughs> you know, <laughs> then that, that gets back to the art thing, because the, the question of whether or not the aesthetic is a answer to the dilemma of the terror of the world, it comes in, in, in deep focus now. Because that's in essence what the civilization has committed itself to. We've committed ourselves to an aesthetic product to try to address the terribleness of the world. You could say it's almost like this effort came oh, yeah. into fruition as a result of the bomb. Because of the terror of that and how horrible it was, and basically everyone around the globe agrees we don't want that. That's about as 
horrible as it could possibly be. And so that is in essence what, what, um, what stimulated the development of a system of control that would provide an environment that we could uh, feel okay about in essence, you know? Well, uh, to, to, to give you one of your uh, uh, instant summaries uh, back, it's, it's in other words, how man's insecurity led to the birth of the computer technology. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, insecurity is built into the fabric of, of all being unless you're completely devoted to the spiritual uh, source. You know, so it, it's only in that yeah. axial age Very. way of thinking where you recognize the impermanence of all things and you relinquish, which is what the Piscean um, abstract was really about. That is, in, in essence, the, the only solution to a material existence that's continually slipping away from us. And yet we have a very difficult time, even those of us who are interested in, in aligning ourselves with uh, the spiritual dimension, we have a very difficult time not materializing it. You know, like we, we already slipped into a discussion of politics there for a minute, which always feels like it's kind sure. of skidding off the road, you know, and I'm really glad that we got away from it and kind of got it over with relatively quickly. Uh, but okay. every time th that politics slips into a discussion, which is sort of unavoidable, but I always feel a little gross whenever it happens because <laughs> because there's almost no good way of talking about it. And and it does feel like you start to lose the, the spiritual uh, orientation almost immediately whenever you get into it. It's interesting because that reminds me of something. It, I have a true life story involving a a friend of mine who lives in Canada now who I got in touch with recently that speaks to what we're talking about because aesthetics embraces all dimensions of life. So there's political art and there's personal art and there's commercial art and sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. There's collaborative art and there's solo art. And then there are the other realms of life at which uh, church and state, you know, come to mind. And, and uh, are church and state truly separable or not? Because spiritualism and church at, at this point is being used as kind of a synonymous, whether, whether a synonym, whether you like it or not. Because to make a long story sh short, my friend was telling me that lately she's been serving time in front of a board about something that has to do basically with local politics, you know, in her region. And that it was a little frustrating for her because it didn't let her get to her art, to the deeper realms where she goes, where nobody knows about, except, you know, a few friends or especially herself. And I had to tell her that those people are never going to see your art. And you have to understand that the time that you put in at these political boardrooms in your own way is your art surfacing for these people. Mm. That's, that's a really interesting, um, that's an interesting story to illuminate the situation. Because I, I think that there's a lot of very legitimate objection to the world of art. You know, and that the emphasis that uh, some subcultures have placed upon art, and I think that you and I both come from from that tradition, you might say, that that has been to yes. a large extent misguided, and and in in some respects, it separated itself from its social, political, and uh, most profoundly spiritual orientation anchoring, and that art absent these things is essentially meaningless and that the process of art you know of art creation and of appreciating great art is preparation for our participation within these domains of you know politics uh religion spirituality social um social concerns you know that the the, the two can't really be separated so you know, the question, I guess, is the degree to which they can really be integrated. You know, it seems that, you know, Nietzsche has that famous saying, um, you know, if it weren't for music, humanity would have been a mistake, right? Something along those lines. <laughs> so, yeah. 
you know, the weird thing about music is that you're really stretching it, particularly if it's instrumental music, to say that it has a political or social relevance that's, this, you know, that's explicit. But I recall that there's this theory by Jacques Atelier, who, who wrote this book, Noise, the Political Economy yeah. of Music, where he basically says that music is the aesthetic form that precedes all fundamental change within society. And I don't know if that's mm. actually true, but it makes sense to me because music is a fundamentally abstract form. It doesn't have a, a very clear statement. So from a Hegelian perspective, uh, it is the abstract. It's an expression. It's giving voice to a feeling. It's giving voice to a mood. It's basically an expression of the human condition. And when the expression of the real human condition is made, that's the motivation for all change, really. You know, because mm. when when we're in a set of conditions, that kind of metal phase within five element theory, uh, we're experiencing yeah. those conditions for a while, a while. We become conditioned by them, right? The temporal conditioning, the kind of postnatal uh, reality of the material world. And that conditioning gives us a feeling for what it is that we're living. And then we express that in some way or another. So the aesthetic appreciation and expression, even if it's not a positive feeling or a positive expression, it could be, right? But whatever it is, it's honest. Like the honest expression of the condition is what produces the change. And it's usually yeah. the change is in the form of a negation. So the reaction to the abstract in Hegelian terms is the negation, which is basically everyone saying, shut the fuck up. We don't want to hear that, yeah. <laughs> you know, which is why all of the major yeah, statements that all the major, like, you know, Stravinsky is, is thought of as being yeah, yeah. one of those moments where, you know, he completely changed the language within music and an idea within society it would be interesting to see what else was going on in society at that moment and what happened afterwards. And the initial reaction from the world that he was that he was presenting himself to, that he was expressing into, was negation. They were horrified. They were like, what the fuck is this? This isn't music. And from that, the <laughs> concrete comes, which is the 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 the, the actual actual change occurs is not just the abstract, it's not the expression aesthetically, it's not just the negation, the mm -hmm. effort of the society to to dampen down and mm -hmm. and and stop the change. Mm -hmm. It's the freaking change itself. So, well, that reminds me of something that I wanted to say a little while ago during this section about things being so bad. Oh, the bomb, right. The bomb came up starting, say, in the 50s, right? I mean, the, the World War II ended with the bomb, right? Okay, so we've been living with it now for longer than either of us have been alive. But here yeah. we are where the headlines nowadays are all about uh, people just randomly shooting each other, like in a William Burroughs novel come to life, you know? The, I mean, the, the cities are just filled with addicts, not only of legal of the illegal drugs, but legal drugs, you know, so on like that. Huh? We've got Trump as president, so you pose this question about the beginning of the nuclear bomb era, but I'm asking about today, where things really are incredibly urgent with extinctions and everything else. Can we accept that this is as bad as it gets and collectively improve from here? I don't think so. I think that the bottom, there's no, the, the, there's no real limit to the bottom. You know, that, that's the thing that's really frightening about history. If you take a look at, at some of the things that have actually happened, you know, our best reconstructions of them, our best understandings of, of the lessons of history, things can get way worse. Just so much worse, you know? So <laughs> get worse, but they, yeah. They could also incrementally get better from here, though. You know, it's if there was possible, enough, because but I look, think that you, absent the great... And, you know, absent the great leveling, I'm not sure how it could get better. You know, that's why you have the whole, you know, not, what is it? That, that the world will end in a whimper, not in a bang. You know, I can't remember who said that. It was like Robert Frost or someone like that. Um, or I think it was T.S. Eliot, actually. And, and so the question is like, okay, is, is incrementalism going to lead us to a, uh, a kind of ever more degenerating state of being? You know, or can we 
turn it around and, and through, let's say, uh, spiritual alignment and um, application of, of true principle, yeah. return to a better state for everyone. You know, it, it seems like a long shot, you know, <laughs> given, given the way things tend to go, but I don't see that there's any better thing to shoot for. You know, because there are people who are ready to to tear the place down. I mean, that's part of of what you're seeing with these shootings is that there's some people who have lost all hope and see no recourse but to go out there and cause some damage. You know, just just to do whatever damage they can because they want to see the whole thing fall apart because it's so corrupt and so dis, you know so dysfunctional, and and they're so angry. You know, for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that actually we have to acknowledge that part of this is the responsibility of, of art. You know, if you take a look at what's happened in movies, for instance, they've been pushing the envelope yeah. so far. And, and, you know, there's nothing redeeming in a movie like... I, I heard a, a commentary recently that I think is really fascinating and very much worth watching, even if you completely disagree with this guy's politics. And I, I do disagree with his politics in many respects, but he's no idiot, and he has some good points to make. This guy blackpilled on, on YouTube, and he does a video that's called something – it's called about – it's something about tolerance. I will look it up and put it in the show note description. Uh, and he uses the movie Seven as an example of something that's just oh, – yeah corroding it's like soul corroding entertainment and he also uses nine inch nails as an example which i think is a great example because i always hated those guys you know i i hated that music i always felt like it was bad news and i never really understood why i just thought you know maybe i'm a little bit old-fashioned like i like <laughs> i like my music to have rhythm harmony and melody you know even if it's a little bit um in your face in some way or another. And, and I think that those are the elements of, of music that are necessary, but you know, a lot of music turned into this kind of, uh, psychological noise music. And, and it's, it's incredibly powerful what, what it can do to the human psyche, yeah. you know? So there's a lot that Hollywood has to answer for and a lot that the music industry has to answer for in what it's done to people's minds. And I, I, you got to wonder, like, if you didn't have art out there, like, you know, all, all the shit out there. I mean, it's amazing how crazy it's gotten. I, a friend of us sent us yeah, a video. Just, you have to realize something. Uh, as long as we're going all the way around, it goes back to that book, which you turned me on to and I read many years ago, which has to do with, if you're going to break it down, why certain bands become popular, why certain bands get signed. What kind of schmoozing went on? Who were the soulless record ad execs that actually, if you went out with a couple of them, you thought were you know endearing? Which ones were father figures and which ones really were total amoral hoodlums and pimps? You know, it goes on on like that because we are not in control really of entertainment values any more than we're in control of a lot of this stuff. We're only individuals. So from my perspective, you know, I have a, 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 an overview of the questions that you're talking about. Because I, too, didn't really like Nine Inch Nails that much. You know, and my girlfriend at the time did. You know, just a couple songs. She wasn't a Nine Inch Nails freak, but there was one, she, you know, Fuck You Like an Animal. Remember that one? Uh -huh. <laughs> she loved that one because it was a fuck <laughs> song of its time, you know? <laughs> so... So, uh, so it becomes uh, uh, all about kind of uh, relativism and morals, and you know, well, that's my kink; it's not yours, kind of thing. You know, if, if you want to break it down piece by piece, you know, because at the same time, uh, not only did I feel the revulsion then, but then in the wake of all these Me Too scandals, in which Harvey Weinstein is the number one enemy. You go to, uh, you know, Walmart, which is where, of course, now I have to go instead of a video shop to find a DVD. And there's a comedy from the Weinstein film industry. And, uh, and, you, and, and it's, it's, it is what you're saying about. It. It, it is revolting humor. And it was, you know, double dare. It was as far, you know, from my patent thing, which is all about Lennon's Imagine. It's as far from 
what Lenin was asking us to imagine as can be, you know. Instead, it's imagining the double dare and the triple dare and, and so on like that and coming up with, you know, whatever you can get away with in terms of some kind of crude humor because crude humor sells. Crude humor can be wonderful. The humor of the low is an amazing thing. But like everything else, it's just all ramped up and you look at all the money and all the schmoozing and all the double takes and all the deleted scenes you know, that went into making this frigging stupid epic, you know, minor epic. You know, there's only like a hundred more of them in the same bin. You know, the, well, the question is, studios. you know, what is it serving? Like you can have crude humor like Lenny Bruce that's actually is serving an illuminating cause. Like there may be flaws and what have you, but it's essentially a humanist approach that's reaching for some truth, you know? And and there are examples of that and where it gets really dirty and and screwed up but there's kind of a reason for doing that and you know like i, I recently watched the uh the the most recent dave Chappelle um stand-up program and it, it's apparently very yeah. controversial and there are some parts of it that i really didn't like but there are some things mm -hmm. that he said that were really important so there's a redeeming yeah. property to the work, whereas I think wow. I, it's probably pretty safe to say that that the Weinstein uh, comedy that you're referring to had little if no redeeming qualities whatsoever. And so there's a lot of that kind of I stuff don't even out know there. It's a C plus comedy that got a thumbs up and got made and, and created right. jobs. But and then I'm what did it do to people? That that, I mean, that's vulgar. the real thing. Is like every entertainment product has an effect upon the the minds of those who watch it and so the question is well what is the conditioning effect of generation after generation being exposed to c plus <laughs> comedies and all yeah, the other shit all the fucked up horror movies it's, all no, the no, fucked up you dramas have a sense of humor about it you have to have a sense of humor about it because if, if you want to take it to the root of the question it becomes a chicken or an egg kind of thing or it becomes the sins of the father are passed down to the son, sins of the mother are passed down to the daughter too, and uh, and uh, and and lowbrow. I mean, the, the the big discussion that was going on at the end of the twentieth century was how highbrow and lowbrow had collapsed and, and had become this kind of middlebrow, you know. And that's sort of where we pick up with the highly budgeted, forgettable movie because the movie industry isn't that old either. You know, the, the, the classic Hollywood era, even the boom B movies of the Hollywood classic era turn out to be pretty good. If you're going to be all aesthetic about about what that was serving then and whether they pull it off or not, you know, in that frame. But I'm just I am recommending to you, though, that. That somehow, even though this is a serious discussion. You have to. It's almost like you had to be there during the filming of that C-plus movie to understand how much fun it was. And I'm saying that as an outsider who definitely takes both sides of the issues. It could be highly moralistic, you know, about the pith of any schmooze and of any, you know, uh, dates that came out of, you know, the making of that movie, you know. But right. on the other hand, I can also be really compassionate, you know, and really know that I'm not the person getting those laughs or feeling that feeling. And collaborating on that effort you know so i have to call it a toss-up if you know what i mean just between me and you and our listeners. well i think what you're bringing up is is really uh fascinating and it kind of gets to the essence of what this whole conversation is about because um you know from like an old testament point of view it's it's easy to judge social ills and react against them against them in the same way that nietzsche did against the church or that marx did against capitalism or that, as you pointed out, uh, uh, Reich did against uh, Freud, you know? So that reactionary yeah. attitude of seeing something that's fucking horrible and going, this is terrible, this is the cause of all of our problems, and, you know, is <laughs> part of the problem. That whole reactionary <laughs> mode of being is part of the problem. And so... Yeah, and you just what, labeled yourself, you just saw yourself as being one, which is really a revelation. It's wonderful. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, it's... it's it, it, 
oh, I'm just painting one side <laughs> of it right now, right? So, <laughs> so right, right, that, right, right. I think it's a valid point what you're making, and I think it's an extremely important one. But on the other hand, right? And, oh, and let me just say yeah. one more thing about that, which is that I think that that is actually more in line with the kind of Christ consciousness uh, universalism that Aquarianism. Uh, it suggests that that is a better mode of operating than this uh, mode of condemnation and resistance that characterizes maybe more of the uh, elitism that has characterized this, you know, the, the, the concrete aspect of the Piscean Age, right? The resulting, right. The resulting edifice. You know, having said all of that, you know, from the point of view of, I guess you could say, like, a fundamentalist point of view, maybe, would be that, well, it's just a very lazy way of allowing all kinds of hardcore bad behavior. Like, it, it's just a, an excuse to allow horrible shit to continue. You know, and so how, where do we draw the line there? Like, how do we envision a universalism Aquarian sensibility that isn't just something that's lazy and says, ah, well, it's all relative. So kids go have a good time. You know, this stuff that's mm -hmm. being produced, even though it's probably damaging to the human psyche and may cause uh, pronounced alienation and, uh, and violence. It's like, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, is that really okay? You know, I, I find myself really caught in, in the middle of that thing. I, I think that it's, it's not easily it's resolved. But I do think that discernment is really important. Like, if we're not going to pass judgment on, on Weinstein and company and all of the various people associated with the production of some pretty fucked up shit, right? If we're not going to pass judgment on them, can we at least be discerning and say that in an ideal world, this would not be going on. You know, it, it just, it, it doesn't do anything to improve our, it is a fundamentally a, a form of decadence. It just, it creates a condition within the human psyche that's not admirable, not something that we would ever hope for. You know, if we want our society or species even to continue in a decent way we have to have better nourishment right it's like it's not good sustenance okay, it's, it's, you gotta say you have to understand that that if we were going to talk not talk about politics and instead end up talking about art we're digging a hole for all those people that you know are artists that get a job say you know in the in jingle industry you know i mean i can say you know, how lovely it is that I managed to mostly, except when I was a kid, avoid having to, you know, be involved in jingles for the man, you know. <laughs> uh -huh. But that doesn't mean that all the people that I went to school with didn't, you know, that were musicians didn't do that. Uh -huh. And so oil, so what we can say with confidence is that all this art really is the product of oil, the celluloid, and the CDs and the vinyl, I mean, they're out, they don't contribute very much to the oil waste problem, but nevertheless, it's all one big umbrella oil thing. Like, you know, plastic people, oh, baby, you're such a drag. Well, we're all plastic <laughs> people. That was Frank Zappa so many years ago, and now it's finally coming out in 2019, you know, that we've ingested too much plastic. You know? And of course, you know, <laughs> so Zapp Zappa, Zappa made, a, the last laugh. Zappa made <laughs> a living off of selling plastic. <laughs> you know? Right, the plastic waffle. The album is a plastic waffle. Yeah. And it's a perfect representation of the art that would come out of society. So you can't, so it's okay to condemn the artists because we are artists. So it's, I feel very comfortable because the, the problems that I was coming at with, aesthetically speaking, in terms of the leveling, weren't coming from quite that place. It had much more to do with how art has no more value anymore because there's so much and because everybody's an artist that's the very first thing to be leveled well that's fascinating and, too because it, it seems like that's the flip side of a degenerate art you know that that you know and i i hate to use that term because i know that that's you know there's a terrible history involved in the use of that term so 
I, I would like to think of a better way of <laughs> saying it. But... You're in good company with those who have railed against, at least the ones that we've mentioned so far. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll, let's leave that problematic for some other discussion. But uh -huh. the quantity and quality do seem to have an inverse relation. <laughs> and you have to wonder the extent to which you know, art can maintain its relevance uh, when there is such a great abundance of it. And when the discernment of the of the audience has been eroded not only by the the qu quantity of the product out there but also the content or the paucity of content and i think there's some hope here because we see now that there's a hunger for uh meaningful uh content that people want to hear real discussions sure. uh that you know, people like Jordan Peterson and, and Joe Rogan represent, I think, that desire for people to to really dig into things and have something uh, that's worth listening to, that's worth thinking about, that will actually help them in some way or another to uh, live better, to live a better life, you know? And, and that, to me, I think, is the fundamental impulse that we need always to be orienting ourselves on, that, you know, in a very confusing world on some of the most, you know, the, just the most basic level, the best we can do is to try to be better, try to try to make things so that we're understanding how to cause less harm. Ideally, you know, I, I hesitate to say it, but, you know, to do better, to do good, to um, to live our lives as best as we possibly can. And and that just seems like, you know, a very basic way of of thinking about whatever it is we're going to get involved in, however, whatever information that we're trying to make sense out of and whatever conclusions we're trying to draw from that inside of ourselves, it's always with that, I think, as the goal, ideally. I don't see what other goal, I guess some people could think of it just as self-serving and there's, you know, a thin blue line between self-serving and living, you know, as best as you can, but it's obviously different. You know, we can clearly discern the difference between you know, some people say, well, there's a big difference between doing good and doing well, right? <laughs> and that English plays this little slippery game with that. There's a terrible tendency for people to think that those who are doing well are actually good. But we see pretty clearly, I think, by now that that's just not the case. And quite often, they're actually some of the worst. You know, Weinstein and company perhaps being uh, good examples of that. But there's no shortage of examples of that. The people who are doing well, I mean, certainly if we take a look at what's happened within the financial business industry, uh, people are doing incredibly well by basically destroying the lives of other people en masse, you know? So, okay, I'm not going to get down into that, into that rabbit hole again, but th there's a couple of things that, that we talked about that I wouldn't mind trying to bring into focus a little bit more. There was, at one point or another, you said something about a benevolent God where, you know, you want, you, you, you would like to cultivate the idea of uh, a God who wants to see the best happen for all of us. And that the relationship with that kind of God is, is, um, uh, how would you characterize it? Cause I, I just remember you bringing it up and, and I had a couple things I wanted to say about it. Well, I have something to say that addresses what you just said and answer this, this question at the same time which is simply life is art. If mm. it's possible for a person to approach everything they do as a piece of their art and that their life is their lifelong art project and they integrate the kind of morality that they would want to exhibit to their children or to their elders or to the nature, you know, and that and they proceed with the belief that somehow if they really do exhibit that morality and they keep on working on it so that their own personal psychology moves towards a greater morality in terms of their own reflexive spontaneous decisions instead of further away from it, then something really can happen. You know, because power corrupts. And if Harvey Weinstein, for example, had only made it to the level of assistant producer and then had to go into real estate or something like that, he probably wouldn't have committed any number of you know, those indiscretions at all. He might have had one or two affairs and, you know, had a normal, you know, semi-corrupt life, you know, if we're going to be relative here. <laughs> but if we're not going to be relative and just try to make it about the best that we can do, 
the way that I've been able to make up for any failures in my own aesthetic project has been because I've always seen the whole life as art, which would include, you know, how I behaved at parties and how I address myself, you know, with my friends and and even uh, the mistakes I've made, you know, that have nothing to do with the overall output. Sometimes that's the thing that inspires a song, of course, you know, your mistakes, the fire, mm. as you say. Yeah. But for me, it's all been about trying to get, and I feel really good at this point because over the last couple of years, I have really felt the refining of my fire, the thing that burns. Usually the thing that burns is indeed a reaction or an anger or a frustration or some kind of sublimation. You know, that's what the artistic process is all about. And the spiritual process as well in terms of, you know, taking the path because there, there's always work to be done, but there's always going to be fire. Like you say, there will always be fire and water. So if the quality of the steam is going to get to that really sublime, gently penetrating level, then, you know, which comes first, the water or the fire? <laughs> it doesn't uh, matter. The point is that the fire, is that wood feeds the fire. <laughs> so right. you compress, you, get, you make the wood better, and because the water that nourished the wood was better. Yes. And with that incredibly cryptic remark, we're going to end this episode. The reason for this is what follows involves a fair amount of five element theory, a little bit of I Ching, and uh, I think that some explanation is necessary for that conversation to be understandable. So I'm going to take uh, the opportunity to put that behind the Patreon paywall. And I think I'm going to try and do an explanatory video sometime soon so that these concepts could be explored and wouldn't have to worry so much about whether or not a given episode would be understandable. I could just refer you to that video. So hopefully that'll happen. I'll let you know if it does. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. We look forward to serving you again soon. In the meantime, remember... Turn that thing over a few times before you pick it up and take it home. <laughs>